Hey friends! Today is going to be a mid-month wrap-up. I have never done a mid-month wrap-up on my channel, so this is going to be completely new for us. But as I have been trying to read 31 books in October, it is day 17 and I am on book 15 and I have two books that I've started but haven't finished yet. So it's going well and uh, I originally intended to do this like I did last month and just kind of update you as I went and that really didn't happen because I've been just haven't looked presentable enough to be on film uh, or at least haven't felt presentable enough. And so I was like, you know what? We're gonna do this Beautifully Bookish Bethany style. We're gonna do a mid-month wrap-up and I'm just gonna go over the list in the order that I read them. And then when we get to the end of the month and I do a full wrap-up, I'll go through and go with um, the stats and um, in order of lowest to highest rated. But this one will just be in the order that I read them. And we're gonna go through the 15 books that I read and the one book that I am unhauling unread because it's a sequel to a book that I read that I didn't really enjoy. Okay, surprisingly a lot of these I own, which is pretty cool. Your girl's not mad about it. There are also some arcs in here um, that I will be doing an arc video of that should be up later next week, so I'm not gonna talk a whole lot about those. Just know that there will be an arc video and we'll talk about them more there. Okay, the first book is A Wicked Magic by Sasha Lawrence. I gave this a 4.25 out of five stars. This book follows best friends Daniela and Liz who find this witch's journal that has a spell at the beginning of it on how to create themselves into witches and they cast the spell and they start doing spell work. The book shows them the spells that they need and at some point one of their spells goes awry and Liz's boyfriend Johnny is actually taken by a creature that they inadvertently create. The book takes place about a year later. Daniela, who goes by Dan for the majority of the book, and Liz have gone their separate ways. They don't really talk to one another and Dan has a new best friend whose name is Alexa and they... Alexa doesn't know anything about Dan, you know, meddling in magic or what have you. After that martial arts lesson from the computer, at the part that we're at in the book, some weird things start happening in Alexa's life as well. And Liz comes back and is trying to convince Dan that she knows what they need to do in order to get Johnny back. And the one thing that I loved about reading just this like basis synopsis, and I've read it to you before and I'm gonna read it to you again because it's beautiful. Set in the atmospheric wilds of California's northern coast, Sasha Lauren's eerie debut novel is about the complications of friendship, taking back power, and embracing the darkness that lurks within us all. And it definitely lived up to that hype. I think this book does an amazing job of showing our three main female characters, Dan, Liz, and Alexa. These weird things start happening and the three girls have to figure out how to kind of solidify their relationship with one another in order to resolve the things that are happening in their lives. And the thing about these three women is that Alexa's parents have both left her and she lives with, I believe, her aunt who is like her dad's much younger sister. Lissa's parents are a hot fucking mess. And Dan's family is very, I would say, like, atypically normal, meaning they don't just look normal on the outside, they are actually fairly normal. But Dan herself struggles with depression and anxiety, uh, mostly the depression aspect of that. And so there's a lot of things um, she does self harms and that is uh, in the book. So if that's an issue for you, know that going in. They all have like these things going on in their personal lives that don't have to do with magic, but also the magic aspect of it makes everything tenfold worse. And so they have to figure out how to deal with their 
interpersonal relationship drama in order to deal with this evil magic that is trying to take over their world. But I really love the way the friendship was done. The magic in this is very interesting because there's kind of two levels of magic. There's this level of magic that Dan and Liz have that there's a specific word for it that I can't think of what it's called. Naive. Is it naive? Are they naive witches? I don't know what the word is. There's a word uh, that describes like the level of magic that Dan and Liz have. And then there is another level of magic that is um, historically passed down from one person to another. So like you have this magic and then on your deathbed you gift it to um, the next person in line to receive this gift. And those people, uh, I believe they're called guardians, and they help keep the bad magic from spilling over into our world essentially. So yes, very much loved this book. Highly recommend, especially during spooky season. It's got some YA tropes. I'm, I'm not saying it's a perfect book, but it was a really good time, especially for a book that I picked up off of a whim because it was purple and it looked like this on a shelf at a bookstore and I had never heard of it before and it's a debut. I think it was fantastic. We then have Hocus Pocus, the all new sequel. Um, so I've read Hocus Pocus a few years ago and then this year I read the sequel part of it, which sometimes is called the all new sequel. Sometimes it's just called Now. I gave this a four out of five stars. This book centers around the daughter of Max and Allison from the Hocus Pocus that we all know and love. Essentially their daughter Poppy and her two best friends go to the Sanderson sister house which their parents have locked up. They've hidden the stub of the black flame candle. Like they've done all of these things to try to prevent anyone from going in and accidentally releasing these Sanderson sisters. But Poppy's never really believed that any of those stories were true. And her friend, it turns out that she has the Sanderson sisters book and they say this incantation at the Sanderson sisters house. And what ends up happening is that Max and Allison and Danny Max's younger sister from the original movie, um, get swapped out for the Sanderson sisters. Um, they take their place in hell and the Sanderson sisters come back to life and it's basically like a rehash of the first story over again. Now what I will say about the new version, it is much more inclusive than the original version. It has more than one race, it has more than one sexuality bonus points for that. Um, if you're interested, I do not believe that this is the plot line that the new movie is going to follow, which is a weird thing for Disney to do in my opinion. Why would you make a book, have someone write a sequel while you are making a second movie and not have them related? Don't know. Um, but this follows as if there was a fourth Sanderson sister who was not evil like the Sanderson sisters and she actually was able to prior to being ending up much like her sisters did uh because of townspeople believing that if one Sanderson sister is evil the three are evil and then they're all evil um she was able to reproduce and have a child and then so her family line has come down through the years I enjoyed it it was fun I wouldn't go out of my way to read it um I had got the audiobook actually for free on Hoopla and it was decent. So if you want a little bit of nostalgia, you can read that. I then read The Haunting of Ashburn House by Darcy Coates and I gave that a 4.25 out of 5 stars. I really enjoyed that book. So this book centers around our main character who is moving to this family home that her great great aunt left for her or her great aunt, I don't know, it's some distant relative left her this house. And essentially her, I don't know, what happened with her dad but her mom died from an illness may have been cancer can't remember uh, and essentially there was a whole bunch of hospital bills and she lost everything trying to pay for her mom's treatments and she had she had no money like she came to this place with like thirty dollars and one bag of luggage and her cat that was pretty much it and she gets to this house and everyone in the 
village neighboring it has said, you know, this house has creepy haunted and everyone is freaked out by it. And everybody was freaked out by her aunt. And there was this weird thing where every Friday she would light a candle in one of the upper tower rooms and people like knew what day of the week it was. Well, she gets there and she realizes that there are things carved into the walls, into the tables, like sentences, like, is it Friday? Light the candle. Um, no mirrors. Everywhere that you would expect to see a mirror, it says no mirrors and it's like carved into the walls with a steak knife. And some weird, creepy things start happening. And this was one of, one of my favorite haunted house stories. I think the thing I loved about it best is there's definitely this part in the third act where some weird shit starts happening. And in any other book that I've read, when this kind of stuff starts happening, you get that moment of, and then they woke up and you're expecting it to happen, but it goes on for so long that you're like, there's no way. This is, ac this is actually what's happening. Really? Huh. Okay. But is it? But like, how long are they going to carry this out before this girl wakes up? And I'm not going to tell you if she woke up or not, or if it was part of the real story. But uh, the way it was done was fantastic. I really love this story and how it layers on just the creep factor. And it's just little things here and there at the beginning. And then it gets creepier and creepier and creepier. Um, she does meet some girls from the town who try to be nice to her, but also kind of just like want to check out the creepy house. And they think it's going to be their first chance to ever check out the creepy house. And they're like the only people in the town that are her age. Not the only people, but like the people that she expects she would be friends with. Um, so they're interesting. The cat is fantastic. I love the cat. Um, there's a lot of great things about that book. It is probably one of my favorites that I've read this month as far as like the spooky books go. I highly recommend it. I definitely will be picking up more from Darcy in the future. We then have Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter by Seth Graham Smith. Yeah, that's it. I gave this a 2.5 out of 5 stars. I have watched the movie. The movie is much better in my opinion. This was about Abraham Lincoln if he were a vampire hunter. Essentially, it takes a lot of the historical facts that we know about Abraham Lincoln, his life, the way that he grew up, and his adulthood, and his um, po political years, the things we know about Lincoln, up to his assassination, and makes it so that if a lot of the choices that he made were more surrounded in him becoming a vampire hunter. That premise to me is fantastic and I think that's why I loved the movie so much. I've only seen the movie once so did I really love it? I don't know but I really enjoyed the movie. This was just very dull to me. Um, the action and like the the thrilling moments that you get in the movie didn't really read on page very well in my opinion and so it just felt more like reading like a historical biography but also vampires. So it was like I'm learning some facts about Lincoln, but am I really? Because how much of this is actually true? I will say that I do know just from my own brain and things that I have, I am a history nerd and I study more history than most people do. I do know that a lot of the things that happened here are factually accurate as far as like where he was when and like his wife and children and things like that. So I know a lot of that was accurate and I do commend the author for doing that mesh of the research and the vampire lore together so well. I think they did an amazing job in that aspect, but it just was fairly boring in my opinion. We then have The Project by Courtney Summers. I gave this a 2.75 out of 5 stars. This book follows two sisters, Lo and B. B is the elder of the sisters, Lo is the younger, clearly because that's how sisters work. One's older, one's younger. Um, Essentially, their parents die in this horrific car crash and Lo is also very injured in this wreck and B prays for some sort of a miracle. And that miracle comes in the form of Lev, who is essentially the Jim Jones of this world, meaning he is like this very, like believes he's the second coming of Christ and he can solve all of your problems because white people fucking love cults. They just do, they just do. And, uh, he convinces B that he can save Lowe's life. And when Lo gets better, despite the fact that she's also being treated medically at a hospital 
B believes that Lev is the reason why she was saved. And so B runs off and leaves her sister in critical health to go and serve Lev and his weird, crazy Jonesian people. Um, fast forward some years, Lo is looking for her sister. She's been looking for B for a long time and she works for this magazine office and she is like the assistant of the guy who owns the magazine. And one of his friends comes in and his friend believes that his son was killed by someone from this organization. And lo and behold, Lo was actually there when the guy died. He was a train jumper and Lo was there and he actually said something to Lo and recognized her. And so Lo kind of puts two and two together, figures that he probably knows B. And so she decided she's going to kind of try to go in undercover into this organization and find her sister. I didn't like this book, clearly, uh, from the rating. So here's the thing. The, my <laughs> I know white people love cults. You know white people love cults. We fucking love cults. White people are weird. There are so many... <laughs> I was not able to suspend my belief enough to believe that anything that happened in this book would have happened. I know people get sucked in by cults. I know it's a real thing. I know that that happens. And I believe that in this world, I believe that B would truly believe that her sister being saved by the doctors was actually Lev stepping in and saving her and healing her and becoming a member of her cult, of his cult. I get that. Uh, also, there's some pretty graphic torture scenes in here so be prepared for that um it's just it's just the things that Lo does after learning what her sister has gone through the things that Lo does makes absolutely no fucking sense I just I can't I can't stand behind it I can't get behind it I can't disbelieve my, I can't disbelieve. I cannot suspend my disbelief enough to, I, I can't, I can't make sense of what happens in this book. There's, there were so many good aspects, but it just was not, this girl's an idiot and she's not an idiot. You know what I mean? Like she's not that stupid. And I know that's kind of the point because smart people get pulled into these cults in ways that you would not expect. And it is about belief and faith and uh, because you know you've had a shitty life for a shitty hand dealt to you in the present and you see someone who tells you that they can solve everything and then suddenly they're solving everything and you're like oh they must be god whatever sent and I just maybe it's because that's not my religion maybe it's because I have studied way too many cults in my life because white people love cults I love learning about them not so much joining them I just did not find this feasible in any way, shape, or form. And because it was so unfeasible, it was unenjoyable for me. We then have A Curse and Ash by Julie Zantopoulos. I gave this a 4.75 out of 5 stars, and this is one of the arcs that I read this month. So I will be talking more about this in the other video as far as how I liked it. But this book follows Ashlyn, who is part fae, part human. The human part of her is a witch. And the fae part of her is like kind of fae royalty adjacent. And she has been betrothed to this fae prince for a long time. In the human world, she works as kind of like a consultant for the police force whenever there's like a magical death. And she ends up meeting Reardon, who is her Ravdi, which is basically the linchpin in how the witches are able to use their magic. And it's kind of like a love triangle, but also Polly and also amazing. And uh, there's a lot of cool like magical things happening in this, but also the romance, but also like amazing friendships. It was a very good book. So if you want to know more about this, check out the ARC video that will be up next week. I'm going to talk about two together. I didn't read at the same time, but I'm going to talk about them at the same time because it's a sequel. So we're going to talk about Spirit Hunters by Ellen O and the sequel Spirit Hunters Island of Monsters. I gave the first book a 4.25 and the second book a 4 out of 5 and I really enjoyed this duology. I don't know, maybe there's more books coming in the future, but it is a mid-grade 
The first book is like a haunted house story. So you get this family with a mother, father, and three children. They move into this house and these really weird things start happening to the baby brother. The middle daughter, which is the daughter that we're following in this story, she has some memory loss and she was like in kind of like a reform school's behavioral place and there was a big accident there and she lost some of her memory um they say you know due to that accident and they get into this new house and her little brother is starting to behave weird and she thinks there's some weird things happening there's like this fire truck that moves on its own accord there's some creepy shit happening in this house one of my favorite things about this both of these books together is I read a lot of spooky books this month so far. These books were spookier than some of the adult books that I read. Like they were fucking creepy. The like ghost possession, the monsters, the especially the second book there was the creatures, the way that they became the creatures and they don't hold back from talking about how they became the creatures. They don't go into violent graphic detail and I think that's why it's able to be a mid-grade versus an adult story but it's creepier than the, a lot of the adult stories that I read this month. Definitely more so than the YA but even more so than some of the adult. It was creepy. Very super creepy. I really enjoyed that there's like the way that the family comes together to kind of defeat the monster. It is um, I believe the family is Korean American so there is some Korean heritage in there as well um, the way that they're able to see the ghosts and those kind of things are in relation to that um, it is own voices for that representation which is always fun to read I highly recommend if you are someone who enjoys mid-grade especially mid-grade spooky spirit hunters um, a lot of people that I know have read it previously and were recommending it to me because they know of my love of mid-grade spooky and it definitely lived up to the hype for me. The next book is also an arc so that will be in the arc wrap-up but it is The X-Hex by Erin Sterling and I gave this a 5.25 out of 5 stars. I gave it a perfect rating. Was it perfect? I don't know but you know me when it comes to a perfect rating sometimes it's more emotional than actual factual. So this book follows our main character who like 10 years prior to the actual main focus of the story um, was dating this other witch. She's a witch. He's a witch. They were dating over the course of the summer and she inadvertently one morning found out that he was possibly engaged and he was going back home to break off his engagement. Clearly she was angry <laughs> and so she uh, decides with her cousin that they're gonna fake hex him and uh, the hex might not have been as fake as she had thought it was going to be. This book is literally just the perfect fall time witchy rom-com that I needed in my life. I didn't know I needed this book until I read it and I was like this this, this is so wonderful. Um, Again, I'll talk about it more in my arc wrap up, but I, I really enjoyed it. If you are looking for um, like fall vibes, the witchy vibes, the rom-com vibes, it is definitely all there. We're going to talk about two again, and it's going to be books five and six in the Sarah Normal series, Moment of Truth, Giving Up the Ghost. I gave both of these a three out of five stars. I am not enjoying this series quite as much as I was. Um, I feel like the plot in these has kind of gone downhill greatly. There's only 11 books in the series so I will probably finish it um, but it's not as good as what it was in the beginning. So this series follows Sarah who is I believe 12 at the start of the story and she and her father have moved from California to the East Coast and they move in with this elderly lady who is like a fortune teller and also Sarah can see ghosts and throughout the series Sarah is learning more about herself and about her powers and like more powers are manifesting as time goes on. Her mother died during childbirth so she's never really met her mom and so there's that is like a big theme throughout the story because her dad knows that she has these powers um, and that 
her mom also had them. So it does take a different approach to that than what a lot of mid-grade or even adult stories do. Um, you know, she's this young girl and though her father has no powers and it's not a world where magic powers are necessarily known, her father does know that this is a thing that she has access to. So that I enjoy. And some of the plot lines have been pretty good, but these last two were pretty meh. It's okay. It's not my favorite, but these are the last ones that I actually physically own, so it will probably be a while before I read any of the others, unless I read them without purchasing them, like borrow them from the library or something. It was okay. I then read The Orphan Witch by Paige Crutcher, which I gave a 2.25 out of 5 stars. Again, this is an arc that I read, so it will be in the arc wrap-up. It follows our main character, who has been basically alone her whole life. She learned early on that anytime she looked someone in the eyes for longer than about five seconds something really crazy would happen like they would try to kill themselves or chop off all of their hair or just they would lose their shit. And so she spent her entire life learning to not get attached to people, not to look at people, and tried to basically whenever something bad happened she moves towns. She has made one friend in this time and that friend and her basically only have like an online relationship and when the next bad thing happens it just so happens that her online friend is like you should really come and visit my hometown. They've been talking about it for a long time and she figures since she's running again now's as good a time as any. The book follows her like learning about her powers and things and about the world that she came from and historical stuff and it's again more in the arc wrap up but suffice it to say I did not have a good time reading that book. We then have A Study in Charlotte by Brittany Cavallaro. I give this a 3.25 out of 5 stars. This book is like a Sherlock and Watson. I don't want to say retelling because technically they are related to Sherlock and Watson. It's just many generations down the line. Our Sherlock is female and she is a drug addict. She's a problem child for sure. Our Watson is male and he moves to this school and basically just everyone expects them to be best friends because they are a Sherlock and a Watson and things happen. I did not like this book. Um, I, I didn't, the plot was a little meandering and didn't necessarily make the most sense in a lot of places. And honestly, it was the drug use that was an issue for me. There's a lot of drug use. Um, heavy narcotics, big time, and starting at like a very young age, which I know happens, but I don't want to read about it. It's not a thing I want to read about. I don't want to read about people my age or older doing hard drugs. I definitely don't want to read about like 12 and 13 year old kids doing it. Zero interest. I know that historically speaking our Sherlock characters always are people who are drug dependent of some sort and that's part of what makes them so intelligent and so crazy and able to think outside of the box but I just don't give a fuck and I really don't have any interest in continuing on with the series and for that reason I am unhauling The Last of August which I also already own um, so rated this unhauling this. I'm just going to consider a study in Charlotte a standalone and move on with my life. Okay. I then read The Lighthouse Witches by C.J. Cook. I gave that a 3.5 out of 5 stars. Again, an arc in the arc video. But this story follows three sisters and a mother who move to the secluded island and essentially move into like the caretaker house of this lighthouse. And the mother has been commissioned to paint the interior of the lighthouse. And what happens is you get three perspectives, four perspectives of this story. So you get the mother, two of the daughters, and then one male perspective that you don't really figure out until a little bit later on in the book how he's going to play in. And while in this time period two of the daughters and the mother go missing and it's the middle daughter that we're getting the perspective of in the future. I think it's like 22 years later and basically she is contacted and she's told that one of her sisters has been found and when she goes to collect her sister she finds out that her sister is the same age she was when she went missing 
and this island has always had this story of wildlings which are like part fey beings who if this wildling comes into your life they basically try to kill everyone in your family line and so you like have to take them to the specific place and burn their body and cut their hearts out and do all this crazy stuff and so our main character Luna has to decide if that's something that she wants to do or not. Again I gave it a 3.5 out of 5 stars and if you want to know my full thoughts arc wrap up. And the last book that we're going to talk about today is The Ivies by Alexa Dunn who is a fellow author tuber and I will link it down below if you're interested in checking out her channel and I gave this a 4.25 out of 5 stars. This was like exactly what I was expecting it to be but also not really. So going into it I knew that this was like a was kind of pitched to me as like a dark academia but not really because it's more of like the darker side of academics and that is one thing that it focuses heavy on is college admissions and this is something that Alexa knows a lot about so I feel like that part of it was done very well. She goes to this like private prep school and herself and four other girls are known as the Ivies and they essentially are this group of girls who kind of do a little bit underhanded things to give themselves an upper edge on getting into an Ivy League school. What Olivia doesn't know is that perhaps the other four Ivies are a little more sinister than she had originally expected. One of the Ivies is murdered early on in the book and so the book focuses on trying to figure out who killed her and strangely everyone that we meet throughout the book has a reason to have wanted this girl dead. I like the trajectory that the book went on as far as like the different bits and pieces. There was some things that was kind of predictable as far as like the things that some people were doing and the way that some things came to be. But honestly I really really enjoyed this book. I think that the reasons for why everybody was doing the things they were doing some were like so outlandish but like I've seen I watched the ID channel like I know people do shit for stupid ass reasons like I know that's a real thing and I just really enjoyed getting to see the darker side of all of these people and what they would do to get into an Ivy League because at the end of it no one comes out with their hands clean and I just really enjoyed that aspect of it. This book does actually carry on a little further than your like whodunit reveal to get some more of like the after effects of what happened. I did really enjoy that as well. Honestly this book would have rated a lot higher if I enjoyed this cover more. I'm not a huge fan of this cover and as you know cover rating is one of the things that go into it. So probably as far as like looking at it from a reading perspective it would be more like a 4.75 than a 4.25 but I just have to give you the numbers as they come y'all. So these are some of the books that I've read in the first half of this month. As I said it's been an amazing reading month for me so far. Uh, I'm super excited to continue reading throughout the rest of the month. Um, we have the World Wide Readathon this weekend and I am going on like a writing retreat. I'm expecting to probably read half the day write half the day during the writing retreat have some fun things to do. Uh, I'm super excited about just the rest of this month and honestly if I don't read a single other book this month I would be happy. I know I'm going to because I'm going to be in a car for like seven or eight hours in one direction um, and then back. So like I know there's going to be some future audiobook listening but honestly if I did not read another book this month I would be completely happy with where I have landed. So let me know in the comments below if you have read any of these books or if you have any further questions or you'd like to discuss these books that I have read so far this month. That is all I have for today. I post reading, writing, book, and planner related videos a couple of times a week. If you don't want to miss anything I have going on in the future make sure you hit the subscribe button and the notification bell down below. And until then I will see you guys next time. Bye! <laughs>